Welcome to another sermon from the Lewis Church of Christ. And now, here's Adam. It's good to be together today. Uh, have you got the memory verse yet? Do you know it? How many of you know it? Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> It's not bad. We're, we're continuing our Acts 29 sermon series today, uh, and we're, we're really learning from the very first apostles, or the very first followers of Jesus, what it looks like to live on mission and how we can be successful at doing that, uh, the mission of, of making disciples of all nations. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish, is to finish the race, the Lord, the, I'm going to get it. My daughter got it last week. I'm not going to look. It's to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Yay. You know, I've heard that verse so much around my house this week, and I, uh, I got up here this morning to go over my sermon, and every time, I, I got it wrong, every time. So it stands to reason, now I'm standing in front of 100 people, that I'm going to get it wrong. Awesome. But that's our memory verse for the month, and I hope you're working on that. Some of you will remember last week, our daughter Lydia was up here uh, to recite that for you, and yes, obviously, she did know it before I did, uh, but I stand before you today a proud daddy. Uh, I was so thrilled to see her up here doing that, but also her excitement uh, for having the Word of God written on her heart. That's so cool, and and to be honest, if I want full disclosure, last Sunday evening at dinner, our five-year-old son Gideon, he got it too before me. So praise God for our kids being smarter than me. Um, <laughs> but really, my, pr my prayer is that that would only continue. My prayer is that our kids and, and your kids would spend their days carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ way further than any of us could ever even imagine it going, right? Isn't that the point of, of, of being a parent, of what we're trying to do? Lydia was really nervous last week uh, to get up in front and speak in front of all of you, and she gets that uh, quite honestly. Uh, so at breakfast, I was trying to encourage her a little bit and, and just tell her, you know, hey, you're going to influence people, like, for Jesus. And she couldn't wrap her head around that. And she said to me, how could Jesus use me? I'm just a kid. How many of you have thought that? How could Jesus use me? I'm just a... You fill in the blank. Jesus wants to use me. Does he know I'm a... We've all been there, right? Can I, can I just encourage you, that, especially in the idea of age, God doesn't care how old you are. God doesn't need you to be any certain way or do certain things. He's simply looking for someone who has a heart that will follow him, that will go for him, right? He's looking for people who would consider their life worth really nothing to them unless they were out there testifying to the good news of God's grace, completing the task that he gave them. That's what he's looking for, and that's, that's what God's all about. He always has been, right? God is a sender. He loves sending people. He loves sending anybody, right? Anything. Think about it. He sent animals to the ark. He said, go to the ark. It's going to be great. You'll be saved from the flood. He, he sent Abraham, right? He told Abraham, I want you to leave your family and go to a land I'm going to show you. It's going to be great. You'll be so blessed. And you'll be a blessing. He sent Moses. He sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, oh, go to the Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go. It's going to be great. I'm going to get so much glory. God's a sender, right? He sent Joshua. Hey, I want you to go and lead my people. You're going to lead them to the promised land. It's going to be great. There's going to be milk and honey. I guess that's a good thing. I never tried it. So I'm not going to, but I'm assuming it tastes, tastes good. He told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent. It's going to be great. They need to hear from you. He told the angel Gabriel, go to Mary, go to Joseph, tell them about our plan. It's going to be great. This thing's been in the works from day one, from before day one, really. God is a sender. And so should it surprise us that when he tells the disciples and gives them their mission, he wants them to go and make disciples of all nations? And that's what he tells them, right? It's going to be great. Right? No. No. It's a little bit different. 
I want you to look at this. This is how Jesus shares this message. There's, there's something great, but he doesn't say it's going to be great. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven and in earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and then of the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to, to, to obey everything I've commanded you. And here it is. And surely I will be with you always to the end of the age. Wow. It's going to be great. I kept reading that this week and, and couldn't help but thinking, why did he say that? Why did, why did he promise he would always be with them? Just a couple, a couple of pages in your Bible later, we've read it a whole bunch of times this year as we've been going through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples, hey, uh, you're going to re receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you're going to be my witnesses. Remember? To Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And, and there it is again. I'm going to be with you. My spirit's going to go with you. Here's your mission, and I'm going to go with you. So go. Why did he say that? Don't get me wrong. I, I love that promise. It's a promise that I cling to dearly every single day that Jesus is with me no matter where I am or where I'm going. I'm so thankful. But I don't think Jesus giving uh, his followers this mission and then promising to be with them always is a coincidence. I think it's very simply because he knew there would always be opposition to his mission. We know Jesus faced all kinds of opposition when he was on this earth, right? Those last three years where he was preaching, he was teaching, he was doing miracles. Then just a quick scouring of the book of Acts and his followers faced all kinds of opposition also. It really started in Acts chapter 5. And it continued all the way through the end of Acts, right? Opposition like jealousy and lies and, and zealous leaders trying to get ahead. There were, there were people pleasers that want to put them down so that they could move forward. There was greed. There was traditions. There was this mob mentality. There was fear creeping in against them, right? Even nature. There were even storms that, that shipwrecked Paul. All of this opposition. And through all of that, God says, go. Go make disciples. It's going to be great huh? Go make disciples with all that against them? And they did, didn't they? They did go, and the church grew and grew, and the world was turned upside down, and lives were changed, thousands of people on the first day, uh, thousands more in the immediate days to follow. How did that happen? How is it that those first followers could make disciples in the midst of all of that? Maybe a better question is, how can we, Right? We have the same mission that they did, and, and looking at, the, at that list that we just looked at, surely we have a lot of the same opposition to how are we going to do this? What makes it possible to go in the face of constant opposition? What makes it possible? Courage. What makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on the mast away? Courage. What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist or the dusky dusk? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the sphinx the seventh wonder? Courage. What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. What makes the hot and cat so hot? What puts the ape in apricot? What are they got that I ain't got? Courage. You could say that again. What makes it possible? Courage. I mean, it, it's what makes the muskrat guard his musk. I honestly have no idea what he just said has anything to do with courage, except that he kept saying courage. That's why I love that. Um, but God followers, they go with courage. Whether it's God telling animals to go to the ark or God telling Mary, you're going to be God's mom, followers on mission for the Lord go with courage. If that's true, then so can we. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than fear. I love that definition for courage, don't you? It's not that we're not going to be afraid, but something is more important. There may be fear when living on mission from God in our lives, 
having courage means going on anyway because we've judged that something is more important than our fear. Is there anything more important than advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Is there anything more pressing than the mission of making disciples? Is there anything more urgent than carrying this, this good news of God's grace to a broken world? Today, this very day, someone's eternity hangs in the balance. We talked about last week, and I'm so thankful that every Sunday, every weekend, we have brand new people here to the crossing. There are brand new people here this morning, and I'm so thankful for that, and I welcome to the crossing. We, we have prayed for you. We want you to be here and, and be adopted into our family and find a home here. But can I share a, a little dose of reality? For every one person who overcomes that intimidation of walking through these doors for the very first time, there are dozens and dozens of people who never will. And so Jesus says, go. Go. And to go takes courage, doesn't it? Those first followers went with courage in the face of opposition, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. All throughout the book of Acts, there, there are really three things that kind of jump out to me that these very first followers trusted in that were critical for them living courageous lives, and, and we can trust in those same things. And the first thing is this, the promise of Jesus. Jesus promised to be with them, to be with us always, even to the end of the age. And that's a pretty bold statement, because right after he said that, he left. <laughs> he, he, he promised to be with them to the very end of the age, and then on a cloud, he went up into heaven. Well, how can we trust his promise to be true? How can we hold tight to that promise? How could they hold tight to that promise? I think the answer is his track record. Jesus' track record. These guys spent three years with Jesus and witnessed almost everything that he did. Jesus claimed to be God, and, and if that were true, surely he would do some God things, right? And didn't he? Knowing what people were thinking before they said it, teaching the scriptures with such authority, almost like, like well, he wrote them, healing all these diseases, getting rid of evil spirits that tormented people, having mastery over nature, raising people from the dead. Surely, if this God-man said that he'd be with them always, we can, they could take it to the money changer. I don't think there were banks back then. We could take it to the bank, right? We can trust that to be true. Not only that, but Jesus explained to them, hey, I've got to go. I have to leave. It's better for you if I leave so then I can send my spirit back. And then track with me. Acts chapter 1, he leaves, just like he promised he had to do it. Acts chapter 2, you know, he... The Holy Spirit comes, just like Jesus promised. And for the very first followers, Jesus' track record in their lives was more than enough to, to give them the courage to trust his promise that he was going to be with them always. What about you? What about your life? What about his, 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 his track record in your life? When you look back on your days and see how God showed up in amazing ways. I love hindsight. I love looking back and seeing how things were orchestrated. That phone call or text message at just the right time. Running into that person thinking, I was just thinking about you. Has that happened to you? Yeah. Answers to prayers that, frankly, you don't remember finishing because you fell asleep. Or prayers that you thought, well, there's no way he's going to answer this one. More month at the end of the paycheck and yet you're doing fine financially. Boldly speaking when really you didn't want to say anything. That overwhelming peace when frankly you shouldn't have any peace. Joy in the midst of sorrow. Courage to stick it out because you know it's going to be better on the other side. Have you seen that happen in your life? Have you seen God show up? That, that's, that's that Christ with me courage. Right? He promised to be with us and, and here he is. He is with us. The very first followers of Jesus stood firm on that promise that Jesus was always with them and they went forward on mission and man, did they overcome some opposition. Some of the most difficult opposition ever. Christ with me courage will, will do that. And they trusted in the promise of Jesus and it was an enormous source of courage for them. And so can we. So can we. 
Another thing those first followers trusted in was the support of their family. I, I love those together passages in the book of Acts. These first followers of Jesus were always together. That's how they did life. That's where they found support. It's where they were encouraged it, it, with the family. That's where they shared the stories of how they were doing with this, this mission of Jesus. And you know, they learned that from that time, those three years they spent with Jesus. There's a couple times in the Gospels we see kind of how this habit started. One of them is in Mark chapter 6. It's kind of cool. Jesus calls the first, this, uh, his 12 apostles, right? And he sends them out in pairs together to go preach. And you know what happened after a little while? They came back. They came back and just shared their stories of, of what happened while they were out doing the things that Jesus sent them to do. And they compared how some of those, those people acted the same way when they preached the gospel. And some people acted completely different. But wasn't it nice to know that we're in this together? We're not alone. We're doing the mission of Jesus together. There's another instance in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus sends out 72 other guys. You know how he sent them out? In pairs together there are no lone rangers in this deal we're in this together we're family and so he sends them out and when they come back luke chapter 10 verse 17 says they shared their stories with joy they were so excited about what god was doing in them and through them well when you jump ahead to acts jesus is gone he has left the building and yet they're still together we first find them together praying together then they're making decisions about, about their mission together. Then they're eating together. They're sharing their stuff with one another. They're praising God together and enjoying being with one another. And then get this. They're out making disciples together. On mission from Jesus together. One in heart and mind. There was never any doubt that their family, the family of God, their brothers and sisters in Christ had their backs. And because of that, there was this incredible boldness and incredible courage that went with those followers whenever they went preaching, testifying to the good news of God's grace. I like to call that Christ with us courage. We trust that Jesus is with us. That's Christ with me. Now it's Christ with us. And there's power there, right? The support of our family together. We're not alone. We're family. Families stick together. You know what? Hard times are going to come. We've got your back. Opposition is going to come. Rejection is going to come. We've got your back. Attacks are going to come. Lies, all different forms of opposition are going to come against you, against me. You have my back. I've got your back. We're the family of the living God. He is for us. If he's for us, who could possibly come against us successfully? We're the family of God in all things. You and I, followers of Jesus, we are more than conquerors. We're the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell can never overcome us. And that filled them with courage. The first followers trusted in the support of their church family and so can we. So can we. One other thing that the first followers of Jesus trusted in that was, was critical to them living courageous lives they trusted in the power of their message. In the power of their message. The message of the cross of Jesus is power for those who are being saved. To see God in the flesh, to spend time with Jesus and see him teaching and preaching and doing all kinds of incredible things, I can't imagine how fun that must have been. Can you imagine that? I think that would have been so cool. In fact, I'm trusting, I'm hoping, maybe I'm praying that, that when we get to heaven there's a movie room. I like movies, anyway. But where we can just dial in a scripture and be like, bam, I want to see you sending out the 72. I want to see you walking on the ocean because I live near it and I know how crazy it can get. Where we can sit and watch Jesus do all these incredible things. Which is so cool. But you know what? Something interesting. Jesus prayed for those of us who would believe, not by seeing him, but believe through the message. John chapter 17, it's, it's the real Lord's Prayer. It's a record of Jesus praying, and it's really cool. He, he, he begins praying for himself, and then he prays for his disciples that are there with him, and then he prays this incredible thing. He prays for you and me. Listen to this, John 17, verse 20. Jesus prays, my prayer is not for them alone, not just for the disciples that are here with me now. 
I pray also for those who, be, who will believe in me through their message. Through their message. Because there's power in the message. Remember Thomas? He gets a bad rap, Doubting Thomas. Remember, he's the one that, that when he was told that, that Jesus had resurrected the grave and it appeared and hung out with the guys, Thomas wasn't there, he said, I'm not going to believe you until I can touch him. All right? And that happened. Locked door, Jesus shows up anyway. Right? And, and Thomas is, is able to touch Jesus and, and my Lord and my God, he proclaims. But do you remember what Jesus said to him? He says, because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Blessed are those who believe because they hear about me. Well, we hear about him through the Bible, through his message. And those first followers, no doubt they remembered these moments as they courageously went out and proclaimed the message of Jesus. Can you imagine the courage it took to tell thousands of people they were guilty of killing God? Yeah, guilty. That's what Peter did. The very first sermon, the very first day of the church, I got a great message this morning. You guys are murderers. Way to go. You killed God. That's essentially what he said. You know, that could have gone real bad. That could have gone really, really bad uh, for the first followers of Christ, right? But instead, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, that message hit home, didn't it? And thousands of people said, oh, you're right. What do we do? How do we fix this? How do we make it right? Wow. It's the message. Stephen, he was another follower of Jesus you're probably familiar with. We talked about him few months ago he went before the supreme court and started all the way back at abraham and told the whole story of jesus what courage that took they killed him for it but he proclaimed it anyway the apostle paul his life mission we're memorizing it and hopefully we're adopting it as our own my life's not worth anything unless i'm testifying unless i'm proclaiming this message of grace and so in that, God tells Paul, hey, don't be afraid. Don't stop speaking. Don't be silent. You keep on. No one's going to harm you. No one's going to attack you. I've got your back. Just a little encouragement from God saying, this is where it's at. Keep proclaiming the message. And so at the very end of the book of Acts, we find Paul, Acts chapter 28, verse 31, the last verse, boldly, without hindrance, Paul was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would these guys do this if they knew it caused such an uproar with people? Why would they keep sharing this message that caused such problems with people that their friends were murdered for? They could have just, forget it, I'm done. Because they believed, they trusted in the power of the message. And they trusted that that message, the good news of God's grace, was more important than the uproar it caused. That's Christ through us, courage, right? Jesus has a mission for us. It's a mission to share the message. And our message is a message of unconditional love. It's a message of hope, of good news, of truth, of forgiveness. It's a message to, to build a life on. It's a message of grace. It's, it's the only message that fully transforms lives and literally alters this landscape of eternity. Truth be told, if you're following Jesus, you're only here because you heard and accepted that most powerful message. So you know it's a message to be trusted. So no matter what the opposition, it's a message that you and I need to courageously proclaim to all nations. The first followers of Jesus believed in the power of the message they shared, and so they shared it with courage. You know what? So can we. All the way back in Joshua chapter 10, something incredible happened. Something incredible happened. To make a long story short, a king gathered his army and then four other kings and their armies, five total armies with their leaders to go fight against a, a, a big town who had made an alliance with Joshua, who was the leader of God's army. And so they went and they, they had a battle. It was a big one right five against one and a half this huge battle but god fought with joshua that day just as he promised he would you see all the way back in joshua chapter one 
when Joshua took over for Moses as leader of Israelites' people, God promised Joshua that he would never leave him, that he would always be with him. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? And so Joshua fought that day with incredible courage because he trusted that God was fighting with him. He trusted that he would have great victory at the end of this day. And speaking of day, just to increase their, their courage, Joshua prayed this prayer in front of everybody. Hey, could you stop the sun over the battlefield? We need a little more time to end this deal. You know God did it. God stopped the sun midday, and it didn't go down for an entire day during this whole battle. Was it, was it more than obvious that God was fighting for His people? For me... For this moment, this morning, that's not even the most incredible part of the story. Something Joshua said to his men, to his people, something resounds with you and, that resounds with you and I today as we continue the mission of Jesus as the church of Acts 29. Joshua said, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This, all that you've seen happen today, this is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you're going to fight. Friends, God doesn't change, right? God's the same 2013 as He was back in this, the day He stopped the day. I thought that one through a little better, sorry. The same way He fought for Joshua, the same way He toppled every one of the opposing forces that came against Him, is the same way He fights for you and I. He's with us wherever we go against every opposition we face. And because of that, we can go with great courage. God is ascending God and He's sending you and me and all of His followers forward on a mission to make disciples of all nations. And that mission is more important than your fears or my fears or all of our supposed shortcomings. So go. Go. And go with great courage because Jesus is with you. Always. To the very end of the age. Amen? Amen? This has been a presentation of the Lewis Church of Christ.